Deborah Perry Schneider, known to her friends as Tango, is the co-owner and publisher of Synergetic Press Limited and has published over 40 books in global ecology, regenerative agriculture, ethnobotany, psychedelic, social justice, since establishing it in 1984. In 1986, she was on the team that designed and built a large-scale closed ecological system known as Biosphere 2, developing the publications and educational programs for the complex 250,000 visitors a year came to see the facility in the early 90s. In 1990, she started the Biosphere Press, an imprint of the Biosphere 2 project, producing a dozen books and classroom curriculum for children on biospheres and biomes. She helped launch the first peer-reviewed journal in closed ecological systems, life support, and biosphere science. While at Biosphere 2, Deborah met Richard Evan Schultes, the grandfather of contemporary ethnobotany. He introduced her to the notion that plant wisdom was disappearing as the people who possessed that knowledge grew old and passed without the ability to pass on their wisdom. She went on to publish his two books of photographs he made documenting people's use of plant medicine in the Northwest Colombian Amazonia. Deborah is currently a director and VP of the U.S. nonprofit, the Institute of Ecotechnics, based in Santa Fe, New Mexico, at Synergia Ranch. The Institute owns the RV Heraclitus, an 84 foot ferro concrete Chinese jump design, which sailed 270,000 miles around planet Ocean and with two years up the Amazon on an ethnobotanical expedition inspired by Schultes between 1980 and 1982. Deborah currently lives at Sergio Ranch, organic farm and retreat center where she lives, contributes to the farm operations when she can, and continues publishing books. So Deborah, Welcome to the Brain Forest Cafe. Thank you, Dennis. Thank you so much for having me on the Brain Forest Cafe. It's great to see you. I'm very excited about this, Deb, because we have so much to talk about. You know, uh, give me a. I mean, we we in some ways we have a, a history that goes back. I knew about the uh, Institute for Ecotechnics and the Heraclitus even before you joined the whole enterprise, because I was on that ethnobotanical expedition up the Amazon, one of the first, with Wade Davis in 1981. And I was a graduate student then, and we were working out of Iquitos, and the, the Institute of the Heraclitus came to Iquitos and, and met with us, and Wade Davis was had been designated the uh, chief scientific officer of the expedition. And that's, I, I met him before, but that was the first time I actually got to know him and spent some time with him in the field. And, uh, you know, like all these expeditions, it uh, had, you know, nothing ever goes perfectly as planned, but it was actually very successful, even though the Heraclitus had, had rammed into a barge or been rammed round by a barge on the way up the river. So it was a dry dock, but we were using uh, another boat that the Heraclitus had yeah. and a couple that we rented at the dock in Iquitos. And we did a very successful expedition. And uh, it was an amazing, unique expedition that you did too. I heard that for, as I came to hear the story and learn more about the story, largely because I managed the archive for the Institute and I have all of the papers and photographs and film footage from those uh, those years when uh, everything was documented. 
And, but there was nobody else doing anything like that. I mean, there was no ship like that out there doing anything. So it was a unique opportunity that Schultz saw for his students. And he said, ah, you know, go, go, go. You know, the chances of people going out and having a research platform in the Amazon in those days was pretty difficult. So uh, I, I came to, to know you decades later, actually. I just heard rumors about Dennis McKenna and uh, Wade Davis, these characters. I also came into the Institute of Ecotechnics first conference was 1981. So uh, it's, it's, uh, we were both uh, right around the same time. I guess that, that, that makes us contemporary, Stennis. Um, right, right. Uh, but the commission, the, 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 the commitment to um, ethnobotany and developing the field of ethnobotany came very, very, through very strong during the 80s as a result of that expedition and the ethnobotanical collections that you made. Uh, three full sets that came to various different research institutions as a result of that. And uh, uh, I embraced what uh, uh, was uh, clearly what motivated the Institute to take the Heraclitus up the Amazon for two years was that disappearing lore of the Amazon. Nobody was talking about it. Chiltis was uh, very much ahead of the game and so wonderful, the students that he uh, educated in this field. You know, it's, 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 and, and as you and I talk about, you know, oh, why aren't there more ethnobotanists out there? You know, institutions for the study of uh, uh, plants and how we use plants. So our, our our joint mission now is really to help cultivate that. Uh, uh, that exactly, study. and and this uh, this problem continues. You know, ethnobiology, ethnobotany programs are being discontinued in academic institutions when they should be be expand expanding. You know, I mean the. University of Hawaii, where one of my best, where I attended, got my master's in the 70s, and then one of my best uh, students, Michael Carl, got his PhD there, and he's now affiliated with the academy, And uh, but they, they terminated the ethnobotany program as soon as he got his PhD, so it's a horrible thing that this is happening, and we have to raise awareness because it's not just the disappearance of biodiversity and the habitats, but it's the knowledge. The knowledge is disappearing, and this is what needs to be preserved. The eco, the Heraclitus and that whole odyssey, the Heraclitus had quite a history before they ever came to the Amazon. The amazing thing to me is it's been till recently, till the last few years, it was on the ocean for since 1973 more or less continue. 35 years. Yeah, 35 and, years. And 270,000 nautical miles. You know, and, and the now it's in dry dock and you're you you're on the far side of doing the renovation. It's got a new hull and I don't know how the fundraising is coming for that. I hope it's going well. We're getting there. We're getting Clytus there. This is an incredible story in itself. This is the famous Heraclitus that we're talking about. There's a picture of it right behind me. Yes, um, yes, exactly. Ferrocement, you might ask, why is it one of the few handful of large ferrocement boats uh, running around the ocean? Uh, because of safety, it's a very safe material. Also, when you get rammed by a log floating in the Amazon River, it doesn't crack the entire ship in half. Uh, <laughs> it just makes a hole. And then Not you can repair it with no, underwater oh, epoxy. Oh. <laughs> no. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it, uh, it, it it's really, I mean, you know, when I first came to, uh, when I was doing my work in 1981, and we met up at the Heraclitus and, and the crew there, I, I'll tell you honestly, I thought you guys were nuts, you know, I mean, you were not affiliated with the time, but I thought, you know, these people do not know what they're doing. You know, and it took me a while to, uh, it took me some years actually to understand in some ways that was the point. You know, you, the Heraclitus people and the Institute for Ecotechnics was inspired, you know, and the whole thing, which I took a while to understand, this is about citizen science. This was about people totally committed to helping the planet and doing what they can, bringing science, art, performance art, inspiration, and all of this together, you know. And the wonderful thing about it is they didn't know what they were doing, and that didn't stop them. They just keep doing it, and they did 
some amazing things. And uh, it took me a long time to understand, you know, uh, really what a visionary John Allen was, because it, it all kind of came from him in some ways. This was his idea. And the Heraclitus is just one of those stories, you know, and we're putting the links to the Heraclitus story and all the other links you shared with me, that'll be on the podcast. So I urge people to learn about it because it's a really an inspiring story. You bring up a really point about today's, uh, I think the tape today's challenge for young people and uh, uh, is the, uh, the lack of confidence in their ability to do. Exactly. Back in the days, it, uh, granted, the conditions were far more favorable for people to go out there and experiment uh, with their lives. Uh, it's it's uh, the idea that you have to be an expert or, or trained somehow to start something stops a lot of things from ever starting. So the idea of learning by doing was fundamental to uh, these these projects, which were demonstration projects. And, and so you have to start somewhere. I mean, that doesn't mean that, you know, people were actually set out to apprentice to masters and to uh, skilled people like skilled engine, you know, the uh, navigational captains and to apprentice and to learn from masters, very much the apprentice uh, uh, system in terms of learning. So it wasn't that you just go out there and do something without any education whatsoever. You have to figure out, you have to talk to people that know, you have to learn uh, how to do these things. Sure, so, but, but you learn you by start. Doing you know, you learn by doing, and, and it's very hands-on. You learn so much more, you know, than you do sitting in a classroom. I mean, I I was, you know, like a lot of my colleagues, I, I got my PhD. I spent a spent plenty of time in the classroom, but the real learning went on in the field, and you can go to the field, and, and I, well, I continue to urge people whether you go academic or go freelance or whatever, spend time in the field. Go out, talk to people who are not like you. Talk to people who live in these high biodiversity environments. See how their lives are and what their interactions with nature are. And, you know, you can't beat observation and you can't beat doing and. John Allen, you know, and I don't want to give him all the credit, although he deserves a lot of it, but John Allen attracted a wonderful bunch of inspired people who got it, you know, who 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 got what his vision was. Very holistic. No real separation between art and science, you know, performance, and it's all part of a mix and well, he had he had that global you you, you use the word holistic because that's really where 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 it was going towards because um bucky fuller was famous saying the end of education was uh with the beginning of specialization and when the institute educational institutions started to just really try to special specialize in different fields and so you know that was you know it was fair good enough people were going in that direction but then we lost the generalist and then people suddenly have no common sense or practical knowledge about things uh so how do we find a balance in that and the idea of, of being more holistic thinking in the late 60s 70s there was a, a big move there was a, a um, complex ecological uh complex you call ecological systems uh, line of work that had started the odoms were teaching um whole systems eco ec economics of ecology and uh, it was starting to break out of the reductionist science approach to the study of naturalist systems, which are interdisciplinary. I have to say ethnobody is one of the most interdisciplinary subjects for a specific hey, subject that feel that there is. Uh, so the idea of being both, you have to, classrooms are great, study is great, That's, that feeds your intellectual you know, mind, your intellectual uh, being. But it's all intellectual unless you put your moving center into going out and doing something with your hands. And then, uh, you know, you want to have something for your heart. So the idea that we are, you know, complex bees, but that we have different different modalities of, uh, and that we need to balance them, you know, not just become an intellectual person without any practical real. So the idea was definitely go out and to try to get experience that would make a person become more balanced in their day-to-day -day life as well as doing something um, constructive for the planet. So there was, you know, the cosmos and thinking about planetary systems and planetary stewardship, but there was also the individual and how to work on oneself to to uh, become a better steward of the biosphere, ultimately. Right. And then ultimately, uh, 
Well, not ultimately, but shortly after you join the Institute for Ecotechnics, you uh, it understood uh, undertook this huge Biosphere Two project, huh? which was uh, again another project. You didn't let you didn't let the fact that you can never do this stop you. You guys went out and did it. You know, and it it attracted a lot of admiration from the scientific community. It attracted a lot of criticism. You know, it was a mixed bag. It was not perfect by any means, but you learned so much. And you, the whole vision was really so much beyond what's even been done now. I mean, I remember talking to a person uh, on the Heraclitus, who's who who is not who passed away some years ago, but Robin Treadwell was her name, uh -huh. and she said, "This is this is the rehearsal for the Mars project," and I was like, <laughs> "What? You're going to Mars? You you people are crazier than I thought you were." But the interesting thing is, now you know NASA and other groups have have tried these these uh, you know trial runs where people live in these uh, isolated environments, you know, and they stay, they lock themselves up for, you know, a year or so, and they see how they can get along. They pretend like they're on Mars. Well, Biosphere 2 was so much more advanced than anything like that, you know, and that was 20 years ago, you know. 30, 30 years ago, Dennis. 30 years ago. Yeah, it's a, it's a mystery, a mystery of history. Um, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, there was a, a lot of um, pushback from, I call it the oil garky, because that was who was running around making decisions about the future fate of our planet. You know, that now we know that 30 years later, they decided that they didn't care that unchecked fossil fuel emissions going into the atmosphere would cause irreparable, irreversible damage on the atmosphere. So that they knew then. We were studying elevated uh, parts, elevated, uh, we were studying all the elements of the atmosphere, measuring inside Biosphere 2, a thousand different sensors. We were studying in parts per billion, the atmospheric interactions between oxygen, CO2, and all the various uh, parts of the atmosphere. So we had a really fine, uh, incredible uh, laboratory for global ecology. And it turns out that there were um, invested interests that didn't want people to actually know all that. Because we were studied elevated CO2 uh, back then. I think it was 280 or something parts per million in the uh, Earth's atmosphere, CO2. Now it's over 400. Maybe it's a 500 now. Yeah. Uh, well, you know, well, so well, in well, the well, last 30 well, years, we've had the yeah. most accelerated growth. And then, and, and, and we were um, uh, it, obviously ahead of our time. Johnny is a visionary. And uh, <laughs> so we <laughs> bumped up against the forces that were somewhat, I would say, perhaps threatened uh, by uh, this private research into studying everything and how it goes to that, you know, there is no, one of the things that we were learning in just the two years we had it running, two and a half years that we had it running. There is no away. There's no away inside of a closed system. It was a test of the Vernotsky theory of the biosphere. Is there a life, is there a, a, a life support system on the planet that is co-evolutionary uh, uh, and self-sustaining? Um, and yes, in fact, there is. <laughs> and and then also it was a, a model of the Earth's biosphere, which had a technosphere designed. Right. Right. So the idea of a technosphere comes from the Russian work. Uh, we worked very closely with the Russians, and, and Valdasky was a Ukrainian-born Russian scientist that founded uh, five major research institutions, uh, venerated in the East like Darwin is here to us in the West. So Vernasky was the founder, uh, the, the first scientist to write about um, uh, the theory of a biosphere. So we were testing that, and so we included in the design a technosphere because obviously the Earth has a non-natural system that is now pretty much all the way around the planet, and and we called it the technosphere. So um, that interaction between how can you design a technosphere that that is in support of a biosphere is was the bottom line. So we were starting to get the idea of natural capital, what is the value of natural ecosystem services and things like that uh, into design. And that was uh, hitherto on. Yeah, yeah. Uh, institutional science is always uncomfortable by people who are not part of that structure and who push the envelope, you know, but this is the way that knowledge advances. 
advances. It, it advances by the efforts of people who don't know enough to know that they don't know enough. That's the important thing. That doesn't stop them. They just press ahead. And that that's what I have came to admire about the Institute of Ecotechnics and and the biosphere program and the whole thing, you know, it, it was, uh, you know, you, you weren't looking for grants, you weren't looking for recognition necessarily scientifically, you were looking, you were, you were in the pure pursuit of knowledge, which is- Applied research, actually. We were developing technologies like airtrons that were uh, spin-off technologies from what we developed in building Biosphere 2. How to, prove, how to make a closed ecological system. So we thought there was a huge market for little laboratory biospheres for all of these, you know, chemical companies that want to do experiments without polluting the atmosphere. They could do it in a closed ecological system. You could see what the, you know, uh, what the effect is on nature in a small system instead yeah. of just, and, you know, trying it in your those, backyard. Some uh, of those technologies. And, uh, that bit uh, awesome. and, and we had air purification systems that were called soil bed reactors that we were designing for use in underground parking garages and things like that, where you would push, they have air fans because that was in the Biosphere 2 design because it was such a small system if there was any toxic buildups. Like you get in garages and parking lots, you know, you just can't breathe the air. So how do you clean that? And then also people used to be able to smoke in their offices and things in those years. So we had, we had one in my chain smoking uh, partner's uh, office next door to me. And it was just a plant in a thing with an air fan going, pushing through the air. And I swear, it just cleaned up the air like, you know, within a week in that whole office system. So we were building technologies like that. And uh, uh, that was how we expected to get the uh, return on investment. So it was a private investment company. And applied research was the, uh, uh, was the mandate. That was confused very much by the scientists in the media thinking that we were all pure research scientists, pure scientists. And, that, and that's what kept saying we didn't have a control, and so therefore it wasn't science. But all of that was ridiculous. Yeah, it was. The, they didn't really understand what you were doing, but but effectively you did it. I mean, the things that you did in biosphere, it, you know, you you were not only investigating the the whole, uh, you know, the impact of the of this being in this closed environment on the biospherians or whatever you call them, you know, the actual uh -huh. uh, bio people in the thing. There was the whole psychological aspect. And it's interesting to me that what's emerging now with these other closed environment experiments is the chief problem with planetary, you know, colonization or going to Mars is... People are not equipped for this. People can't spend time in these environments in that kind of isolation. And you know, and you you discovered that some of that too. I mean, it was hard. actually we had some solutions to that uh, after the first experiment. It was having diversity in the cultures, having a, a and John's work after Bias for Two was really in the, in the ethnosphere and studying of the cultures around the planet. And he, you know, because we had not a very culturally diverse crew, the, just the eight. Uh, then the next crew, when we put in the second mission, we did. We diversified the cultures. And there's something that happens to the sensibility of the group when they're having to communicate with members of other cultures. So that was one of the key indications That's that they found. one of the key things, as well as you're simulating parts of the, you know, major components of the planetary biosphere, which these other experiments haven't even, haven't even attempted to do that. But you had these desert and alpine and tropical biomes, and and you were trying to understand how it all worked together, you know. So oh yeah, I, there's a I, very difficult uh, situation with NASA because they had such a uh, resistance to the life systems, you know, that they were embedded in hydroponics, and uh, we were soil based agriculture. Uh, so, but there's a bit of a hybrid thing for you know space travel, but. Uh, that I think is changing somewhat. There was actually at the time there was something called the Mars Underground, um, and yeah, we were definitely working on on Mars uh, bases and and human uh, exploration of space and trying to make contracts with you know uh, that there was no private space interest. Space Biospheres Ventures was the name of our company, and it, it was probably the first private space venture. Uh, two of the Biospherians uh, went off to uh, start there are doing the space tourism stuff. Uh, in Florida, two of the yeah no we had Mars on in on our radar very 
very much uh, front and center. And uh, it's interesting to see the Challenger shuttle, the shuttle documentary now coming out, you know, 30 years later, looking back, because that really did impact the uh, enthusiasm for uh, Bice for Two. We had the young astronauts uh, organizations and things like that. And a lot of that got impacted badly for that decade. So things, uh, uh, but um, the idea of how to go out into space and to explore without having a means, a life support system with you that included some of the things that humanity has grown accustomed to, like having tomatoes or happy, you know, culture and, and, and things like that. It was, it's, it, it, that was something that Space Fighters Ventures was, was very much making sure that it was a whole package and not just, you know, right. uh, uh, not, uh, not uh, a, a, lot of, a, a lot of this pioneering work has now been reflected in some of the work of another one of the major friends of the McKenna Academy, Dr. Bruce Damer, who's an exobiologist and has has designed orbiting biospheres for NASA, effectively capturing asteroids and turning them into into little greenhouses, you know, and much of his inspiration comes from the Biosphere 2 project. Less and I think you know, anyway, I, I don't want to get off too far into what he's doing, but he, he's another visionary. He's one, another person that we're very happy to have in our, in our, uh, on our team, basically. And I did, we did a recent podcast with him, but, uh, I want to, uh, shift a little bit and talk about the synergetic press and because you've done all these things, but then the Synergetic Press, which you started, basically, you were in London, you started that, and that's been a huge catalyst, I think, for consciousness change and consciousness advance. You've uh, kind of staked out, well, the two major areas, I guess, correct me if I'm wrong, are psychedelics on the one hand, and then what you what you term biospherics, you know, the whole uh, environmental aspect of some of the publications that have come out of Synergetic Press are extent uh, are are significant, you know. And if, if I can blow my own horn a little bit, we published the you published the proceedings for the ethnopharmacologic search for psychoactive drugs fiftieth mm -hmm. anniversary. Which is right yeah. behind you. So it's told. that is. I will be very happy to feature since it is such a, <laughs> an amazing collaborative venture. This historical it was a, publication. It was indeed. We pu you published the 1967 proceedings, and you published the the 2017 proceedings in that beautiful double volume book, and uh, people can still yeah. order that off. They the can. Synergetic website. They the can. Pharmacologic search for psychoactive drugs was the most significant conference on this topic that had ever been held. When it was held in 1967, you know, but it was a closed conference, and we wanted to have an open conference, and we did. Thanks, in part, to the help of uh, you know your colleagues at uh, the October Gallery and. In the UK, well, well, they hosted our our conference team, and then of course when I approached you about publish the proceedings, you were like, "Hell yes, bring it on!" <laughs> and and that we, was the we wildest did a email. fantastic I... job, you know. And uh, I and then we have the ESPD fifty five conference proceedings, which are somewhere in the pipeline. I don't know when it will be published, but it will be published uh, from the from the 2022 conference. Another significant historical, um, I call them a knowledge base. Uh, these are these are knowledge bases. And um, uh, and that's what, you know, I've been really dedicated uh, to. Uh, when somebody comes along with something like this, uh, Luis Eduardo Luna came with me in 2000 with the Ayahuasca Reader, for example. It was the most comprehensive collection of writings on Ayahuasca at a time when there was nothing. And so it was right. like, oh, yeah, so somehow I have to figure out how to publish this book. Uh, and that was a no-brainer because of our uh, long-term relationship and connection and everything. I had to be involved in this. And, and uh, I was really grateful that you that you let me come to the conference, of course, because that's when you find out exactly what's what's being said and, and, and have the vision for how it can come together. And, and it's really a, a community effort, that publication. And 
uh, and it's making science accessible for to to people that might not otherwise uh, ever uh, have access to this material. So that was the other uh, innovation, I think, in bringing this book out and having such a popular uh, readership as well for these scientific these these scientific proceedings. Right, and Synergetics, uh, I understand, has formed a. Have you have either acquired or formed a partnership with Transform Press, which is we do co-publish with Transform Press, state, co-publishing uh, ally with organized groups uh, and uh, uh, partner with uh, like-minded individuals and and Wendy and Transform Press, you know, they just fit right in and, and you know, being a small independent uh, presses, we are a rare breed and survival is uh, in in getting economies of scale. So we did. Um, in 2019, 2020, uh, reach out to uh, both Transform Press, and uh, we had, you know, had conversations, and it was uh, it was a good time to combine our forces and be able to offer uh, to them, you know, full trade publishing, distribution, and and uh, production services and things like that. So uh, that's been a wonderful relationship. We also did s- uh, similar with Maps, and, and their a strong line of publications that they did starting back actually around when we started 84, 85, they brought out a series of books and helped to and sponsored a series of publications on uh, psychedelic medicine that where there was a void of uh, information and knowledge about. And then we were able to bring that whole in and get that global distribution to those works. So, uh, and then we have some other, uh, we have an environmental press we're looking at right now that uh, is also a very well aligned. So we are working and getting these building blocks of uh, collaborative ventures to keep the independent press going. It is a challenge to do that with so much uh, competition, but uh, things like this, these kinds of podcasts and and our ability to get the word out and reach a popular press uh, with our uh, very specialized, uh, some people might call them niche, but we feel that, you know, for many years we were creating the market for these books on ecological thinking, total systems thinkings, but we feel now that there is a uh, new demand for these kinds of uh, do-it-yourself, how-to, like the Regenerative Landscaper book we just published, uh, you know, that's selling very well. The psychedelic medicine books have been, you know, a very strong, uh, the, the, the strong industry that we experienced this renaissance in um, uh, psychedelic medicine. That happened. Now we're looking for a renaissance in reading from the younger generation. That's what we're, that's the age yeah. I'm looking to well, cultivate. That's that's very necessary. You know, you've been able to uh, with your alliance with the Transform Press, you've been able to bring some material from Shulgin's notebooks and archives and his lectures that were. Well, they're amazing. It's not available to people. And, That's just, uh, I know, they're amazing. That is some of the most rewarding. I mean, all of the work that we do is very rewarding. But, I mean, to be able to bring out, to work with Wendy at Transform Press, this is this is Sasha Shulgin's courses that he gave at uh, Volume 1 and Volume 2, transcriptions from his 1987 course on um, the nature of drugs. And there's still one more amazing. volume to go. There's one more volume coming. I have the first one. You need to send me the second one, Deborah. You owe me that. But the first one, I mean, anyone that's familiar with with Sasha's work, you know, can you imagine what it's like to sit in a classroom classroom that's taught by Sasha Shulgin? You know, what an incredible experience. And when you read these, these books, which are effectively transcripts of his lectures you realize you know what a genius he was and what a what a wonderful soul he was you know he puts so much feeling i mean this was a topic he was passionate about you know and we sometimes talk about you know the spirit of plants and plant teachers and all that. Well, Sasa felt the same way about chemistry. You know, he used to talk about the little drug souls of, of the molecules that he made. Yeah, you know, he, it was just great that you're bringing. And then you did a major, a major book about Albert Hoffman, who is another giant in the field, the mystic chemist. Uh-huh. That book has not been recognized as much as it should, but it's a treasure. You know, that book's a treasure. Absolutely. We're working on increasing our profile so that more people can find out and discover uh, these 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 treasures. But we have to remember that there wasn't 
a big demand for these books until uh, until actually the business of drugs came out in uh, 2020, I think it was, uh, uh, and uh, that was that that first Netflix series that came out. It started to you know as things opened up, and then so the popular uh, that now is is. Uh, uh, it has just simply skyrocketed the demand for for these yeah. kinds of books, and it's wonderful to see them. And you know, we went to the Maps Conference, and it was just tremendous uh, amount of book sales and demand. People walking to the cash register with stacks of books, you know, three feet top high, yeah. shoving them well, into the more rooms. like that. We need to do more conference. <laughs> so I, I put a link to synergeticpress.com dot com on the chat and. It'll be on the podcast website. I really urge people to look at synergeticpress.com and, and browse the catalog. because And you are an affiliate these... partner of ours, so anybody that follows that link will get a 20%. There's a there's a coupon code uh, that is also going to be put in there with that link that you'll get a 20% discount off on any books that you order. And 20% also will go back to the McKenna Academy. So... Uh, oh, it helps with the mechanic can so be at the same time as giving us a discount visit on the, the book. Definitely the website. So. We need the money. <laughs> yes. Yeah, so, uh, you, you and you know, there's so some great books are... there, and everybody anybody can email me if they're having any problems. But, um, you know, we have been 40 years. This is 40 year anniversary of my uh, being and having the synergetic process. Uh, really, my career, uh, a life, uh, a life career, and. Yeah. Um, and it's uh, it's just been a lifetime of adventures, really. It's uh, I can't think last, of last last year's con last year's map conference was also sort of the coming out of the second edition of my other my mm -hmm. memoir. This I the, know it was, the, and you had the mists, which is right there behind that's you, right here behind me. Yeah, I know. We we're very proud to have this book, and we're just very very excited about the collaboration that we have with McKenna Academy. I adore you and, and half of your board, who I know personally and are good friends, and we will look forward to, we continue with this mission to make ethnobotany the cool discipline to be getting your degree in and finding places where, you know, uh, people can actually learn that. One one of the things when we get the ship back in the water, Dennis, is we want to, to reactivate our um, uh, hands-on learning programs, and we'd love to have uh, ethnobotanical training programs on the Heraclitus that perhaps could be developed in, in association with you or other organizations that do that kind of work uh, we well, we'll be spending totally. about two years in the amazon area or in the uh, columbia area uh we're completely down with that deborah we're, we're totally down with that one of the things we've got going with the academy right now is we're gonna uh start offering a ethnobotany course online uh we've already got the material michael co-created it so that that virtual course could sink in very well with field courses. I would love, I would love to do those on the here yeah. in the Amazon. That would be totally fantastic. And yeah, we just we because, we really just really like to do stuff, you know. So well, I you got to do stuff. The ship is we the ship is close to back in the water, and then we're just going to be looking for stuff to do. So uh, and it's our biomic, it's our ocean biome project, the Institute's Ocean Biome Project. And without that. Um, it's kind of hard to be um, called a planetary organization. Uh, we have a rainforest project. We have a city biome project. Uh, this here at the ranch in New Mexico is our desert biome project. Um, and, right. uh, you know, we've worked in grasslands. And it's, so uh, it's, it's not just thinking confined it's... to the ship. The ship is a big part of it. But you've got these different uh, installate. You've got things going on in Puerto Rico and in Australia at the Synergy Ranch, I really urge people that want to get into this field from whatever angle to look at uh, the links we have, learn about the Institute for Ecotechnics, and 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 look at the look at the book catalog, and and you know it's it's a it's a volunteer kind of driven enterprise, and uh, you know the the uh, the 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 target is young people who many people, especially in the younger generation, are wondering the planet is facing so many challenges on so many fronts and you feel paralyzed. What can we do? Everything's falling apart. This is something specific people can do, you know, to try to work. That's right, Dennis. 
and to try to understand it and make a difference. And you guys are catalysts for this. And uh, I, used to. You know, I, I am so proud to be associated with you and Synergetics and the Institute and Ecotech. I've learned a lot. Uh, Same. And, uh, you know, I just realized we have a rainforest project already, Dennis. We could be doing those ethnob ethnobotanical courses there now. I'm sure 3T would jump at the chance of talking about that. So, um, you mean in uh, Puerto Rico? In Puerto Rico, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, we, she, she needs something that. else. Yeah. I'll, I'll propose that idea. Uh, so, but we, uh, so it's about right time, right place, right people, right ideas um and uh and and just uh, not not hesitating you get if you get those people together and you have a, a clear task that did just do it you know you figure out what you need to learn to do it you know um can i take it on your on your website on either the institute website or the synergetics website there's contact information if people want to uh get involved in some ways they can contact you Certainly, they're welcome to send an email to connect at McKenna.academy, but we don't have to stand in the middle of that, you know. Yeah, well. uh, I mean, we're we're partners. Uh, so I wanted to ask you uh, the the current situation with the restoration of the Heraclitus. I think your schedule has slipped a little bit. It was we did slip a little bit. Relaunch in 2024. That's probably not going to yeah, happen. Yeah, we're very close. I think we'll be able to paint the ship. We've, we're close to having the paint sourced and um, and the funding to get it painted and sealed so that we can put it back in the water. The 84-foot hull has been completely rebuilt and beautifully uh, uh, filled with um, uh, all of the rebar, of the frame, the mesh wire mesh frame, which you saw, Dennis, when you were there uh, in 20. Uh, when was Girona? 2018? Um, 2019. 2019 at the World Ayahuasca Conference. Yeah, the World Ayahuasca Roadmap. Conference. And then uh, COVID hit, threw us, uh, set us back about almost almost uh, four years because we had to stop construction. We were three quarters of the way finished with the hull, uh, uh, pouring the concrete. And uh, we only had two more weeks left to go. And uh, the an entire construction crew had to leave. And it took us three years before we could get them back there to finish it. So it has been finished and it's just... Uh, incredible floating uh, ar artistic installation when we get it back in the water and then we'll re-outfit it and we do plan to take it uh, across to Colombia. Uh, there may be a, a pit stop uh, and in Italy. Uh, we'll see. Uh, but uh, <laughs> the, 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 um, the last stretch is in, is in view and there is, uh, that's the focus of our efforts this year to complete that and get that back in the water. Uh, because it was such a, a a place for people to be able to come through uh, to 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 meet us and to see us and for for our work to uh, really be on on and to be on the ocean, the idea is see people to create a culture uh, to work to work with other and align with other ocean people that live on the ocean. There is a culture of sea people and to you know really make that that's various some some individuals that want that to be their way of life. So. Um, it's uh, and it's in a, it's it's the it's the biome that is right now about to go past the boundaries, and uh, you know we could be documenting the you know the demise of the largest biome on the planet, uh, or <laughs> helping with uh, solutions, uh, helping hey. to bring solutions to places where uh, I and also we want to be doing educational programs more virtual because in the old days there was no satellites up there where you know video cameras up leaks saw you know the internet that wasn't happening so much, but now. We can communicate much more uh, regularly and bring uh, stories and to, and to bring the stories of of the sea and the stories of yeah. the ocean and the uh, life there to uh, a, a you, whole you just took the Heraclitus people. anywhere on the planet, and yet it's still totally integrated with what you call the technosphere. So you know the communication networks exist. Uh -huh. uh, yeah, uh, it's uh, it's so people can see if they visit the podcast website, or if they visit any of the links that they'll find there, they can see this restoration project and how how it's progressive and so on, and they can support it. You know, people well, can donate to support it. Uh, we sure are a nonprofit, oh, and people can get tax-deductible donations if they send, um, send us right. one through our website, yeah. Right, right. And a project like this 
always works. It's always a shoestring proposition. I mean, you're doing a great deal with not enough money. That's the way nonprofits operate. That's certainly the way we operate. But uh, support is appreciated. And, you know, the Heraclitus is just an incredible story. I mean, any yeah. ship that's been doing this since 1973, I mean, that is a long time. You know, with the hiatus while it was getting repaired, but it's still it's still out there, and it's and still we are looking for expressions of interest from organizations and institutions that might like take advantage of a uh, a research ship that would be going into these areas uh, around pretty much around the Caribbean and in in the Amazon area over the next five years. Uh, so definitely get in touch. Yeah, absolutely. And when you get it down to the Amazon, then you know, we can start to do these programs that you're talking about. And if I'm still uh, able to walk and talk by that time, I hope I will. I, I will come down <laughs> and spend some time. And uh, I'm sure we can. I'm sure we can get Wade back there, and uh, we could have you could have an incredible, like traveling ethnobotanical expedition, and we can we can have courses. Present. That's what we've been dreaming about for thirty years, Dennis. Well, we we don't probably don't have another thirty years, but let's make it happen in the next five years, you know, at least. So that would be that'd be fantastic. Uh, well, we appreciate the alliance that we have because that's the, that's how these independent um, nodes and 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 cutting edge thinking uh, thought leaders can get, like you say, break out of that that mold and. Um, uh, your voice has been, you know, you have uh, such a tremendous voice and you reach a number of minds and, and uh, it's really important that we share these stories that we have today. I really appreciate you bringing them out because they will otherwise remain the hidden mystery of history. And uh, it's just... <laughs> well, lots, lo you have lots of lots of people that love what you're doing. It's not just me, but I'm, I'm glad to be a part of it and to have played a role and continue, continue to work with you. You know, like I say, I'm totally on board. I, I've done a complete 180 from when I, I we started out and you're doing great work. And is there anything in, that we have not discussed that you want to be sure we talk about before we close this out? Well, that's a very good question. Um, well, I guess I would just say that I'm looking for how to really become transmedia-like, how to be able to lift the stories from the pages that we publish, the the wisdom that is held there, and make them and and to uh, uh, transport them into ways that people, the, this next generation, will be able to uh, be brought in to uh, appreciate that knowledge and that experience so that it would meet so that this will reach the next generation that I'm uh, that 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 there is a next generation and I feel like now there is a next generation that is actually asking the questions and and looking for this knowledge I mean it's, it's one thing to have stuff to give but yeah, if, if there's nobody there asking for it uh, so I feel like there there is a, a hunger that now can be fed yeah there there is absolutely a hunger and uh Certainly books, you know, the books that you're putting out. The thing is, the younger generation, they're like, what's a book? You know, they, they're they so digitally oriented. But one way to approach this, and you've already done that to a certain extent, and we're trying to do that too, is through these short documentaries, you know. And you already have this really very interesting documentary, the uh, uh, Academy... Station got a documentary out, a biognosis documentary. And that's the first in what we hope will be a series. And I can think yeah. we've already got uh, a person interested in making the second documentary, which would be which would be focused on coca and the the uses and benefits of coca, not as a drug, but as a medicine. The, and then the third one, I'm getting this inspiration as I'm talking to you, the third one should be about the Institute for Ecotechnics and, and the Heraclitus in phase two or three of its life. That would make, would make a fantastic documentary. Anyway. That's that's no, that's a really good idea. And also, there was a film documentary. That, 
So we can mention the Spaceship Earth film that came out about yes, Spaceship uh, the Aquatechnics work. Right. It is on uh, it's on Amazon and on Hulu, I believe. Uh, it is a full on documentary. Came out in 2020. Really features the first half. A lot of great history about the Heraclitus. Uh, mostly our archival footage, and then it goes well into Biosphere Two, and it gives a really good insight into what that that the the mystery of that history uh, was all about. So. Um, I agree with you. I think that the films telling the mini docs, telling the stories to help uh, uh, to inform and to capture the imagination and to to bring those people to we do now we're doing everything in ebooks as well and, and audiobooks is is another major forum. So let's keep telling the stories, Dennis. Absolutely. That's how we do it. We're trying to tell the stories that'll resonate with people and and document the knowledge of our planet, which still has a lot going for it, even though it's got challenges. So so that's great. We'll make sure. I mean, beautiful thing about doing these podcasts is the podcast is one thing, but then there's all the supplementary material. And I hope that people will visit this podcast and take some time to browse through the links that are there and learn what's really going on. And, you know, if you're a person able to support any of these causes, it's money well spent. You know, you could feel good about that. So, uh, yeah. So it's it's been an uh, absolute pleasure talking to you, Deborah. Same, Dennis. We need to spend more time talking together. You bet. You bet. All right. I okay. will say goodbye, and uh, we'll talk downstream. Well, have a have a great rest of your week, and we'll talk again soon. Okay. Thanks so much. Hi, this is Dennis McKenna, and I'd like to thank you for tuning in to our Brain Forest Cafe podcast. We really appreciate your interest, and uh, we'd like to ask you to donate to the McKenna Academy so that we can continue to fulfill our mission of fostering symbiosis with all living things and bring you excellent content and stimulating ideas such as you can find at the Brain Forest Cafe. You can visit our website at mckenna.academy, and if you look at the website, there are buttons all over the place for donations. So any amount is appreciated, and we hope you continue to follow us as we do more podcasts for the Brain Forest Cafe.